everybody. This is Stephanie Rupert. Thank you for tuning in to the Naked Humanity, Once the Meaning of Everything podcast. Today is episode number 32, and I have on Dr. Iluna Pierce, who's a specialist in loneliness and experimental psychologist here at the University of Oxford. So this conversation, which I just finished, it's really fantastic, went fantastically. It is so important to be talking about our connections with one another and our loneliness and our social health. And Dr. Pierce, uh, who goes by Ellie, is incredibly thoughtful about our current situation and what needs to be done about it. In addition to, of course, being a very rigorous uh, and thorough scientist uh, who studies these things with a lot of precision and sophistication. And I am very honored and, and grateful to have her on the show here today. I actually first encountered her work. Uh, I went to a talk by her and, at Oxford a few months ago. I had seen an email and I thought, oh man, I have, I have to go, I have to go to that talk. And it was about loneliness in the modern world and specifically ways in which singing can impact uh, the experience of social bonding. And it's singing is not the only thing that has been studied in this way. I am a dancer, as many of you know, and dance has also been looked at as something that can really create powerful social bonds and, and just make you feel good. You know, you ever just, singing and this is specifically singing within a group you know but do you ever uh, go into a church you've never been in before and sing or uh, end up singing or dancing with a group of people you didn't know and you end up feeling great or just having an interaction with somebody you didn't know on the street and it went really well and you connected for a brief moment all of a sudden it feels great right we are wired for things to feel great when we connect and so that is what we explore today and the ways in which these connections have been changing in the modern world and what what we can uh, perhaps do about it, um, which is really exciting. Uh, so Dr. Eileen Pierce, she's, uh, she's now taken a role at University College London um, and did uh, research, has done research at Oxford um, for quite a while in experimental psychology, the Department of Experimental Psychology. And she was the bioanthropology representative uh, for, for that group. She's published papers um, everywhere and done a lot of really cool work establishing uh, the importance of certain kinds of remediations for the sake of our social health and working against loneliness, which is in its way an, an epidemic uh, of sorts in the modern world. And so it's a huge honor to have her on. Uh, and again, the, the conversation is fantastic. So do please uh, let me know what you think. Drop me a line uh, on Facebook or Instagram or Twitter or what have you. I would be more, uh, more than happy to hear what you think about this episode and about your personal experience of loneliness, which as we talk about in this episode is something that, um, that we all share. So uh, without further ado, here she is, Dr. Ellie Pierce. Hi, Ellie, welcome. Thank you. Yeah, um, thank you. It's always a little interesting for me when I talk with people who are in Oxford, and I'm also in Oxford, but we're yeah. video conferencing. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I don't know. Wait, are you in Lineker College now? Yeah. Yeah, okay. Because I, um, I did my doctorate at Lineker, so... Feels like there's a nice connection there. Yeah. I think. Wow. I I don't. I'll gush publicly. I think Lin. I just love Lineker so much. Um, it's lovely, isn't it? It's very welcoming, and uh, yeah, there's a family feel there, which is lovely. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. And for people listening, that's uh, that's not altogether um, common in institutions like Oxford. But Lineker is amazing. When I came to Oxford, I thought I would try and get out as fast as I could. I would only live here for two years. Now I'm only done with four, and I'm trying to stay five. So, um, yeah. yeah. And appropriate, given we're going to be talking about loneliness, that it's so friendly there. So. Actually, I mean, yeah, because when I was here initially, I was. I was in a very lonely period in my life. And uh, after I lived here for a while, I moved to London seeking happiness. I moved to San Francisco. Wow. And then finally I realized that if I just let myself be present here in this community mm. and develop those kinds of 
communal bonds, then I might actually have some satisfaction in my life. And it's, I think, a very significant piece of, of why I'm emotionally stable now. Mm, definitely. I think it's yeah. definitely that kind of consistency of relationships and recognizing that it takes a while to build up friendships. So mm-hmm. moving and particularly, I don't know if you were moving from the US straight to Oxford, but that kind of, you know, changing country, being away from family and friends. Um, I think people definitely think that kind of um, very transitory lifestyle might be one of the reasons that loneliness seems to be very prevalent at the moment. Mm. Um, and there, I have a question that I really want to ask, so I'm going to do it and then I'll get back to our scheduled programming. Um, <laughs> do you, is there any sort of empirical basis that distinguishes between singular relationships that you have, say you live alone and you have four friends spread out over a city versus living in a like communal environment or something like that. Like there are, there are, is there quantitative differences? I'm assuming there are qualitative. Uh, It's interesting because at the moment we're still trying to work out what loneliness is and how to measure it. Hmm. But people have definitely distinguished between relational um, loneliness or the loneliness that you get if you don't have an intimate other. So if your partner dies or your relationship breaks up um, versus kind of communal um, connection, being part of Mm -hmm. a group, um, a community that's something larger than yourself. So that's definitely been distinguished in the literature. Uh, But I think we're still trying to get a handle on whether there are differences between the experience of those two kinds of loneliness um, and um, yeah, how to measure that um, properly. So yeah, I would say so, but um, it's still early days. So <laughs> Right. And there would, I imagine, be so many variables based on context and personality and all that sort of stuff. Yeah, exactly. I mean, I'm always really fascinated by... Um, you know, we talk about uh, people don't have sufficient numbers of connections, but what is a sufficient, you know, how many friends do you need? Um, and the work of Robin Dunbar, so I work with Robin, um, he talks about layers of a social network so that we need um, about um, five close friends, um, which is our kind of support core. And then we might have, um, that might be part of 15 friends who you are close to, but you're not as close. And so these layers uh, decrease in intimacy. Um, But also there's going to be individual differences, uh, maybe based on introversion, extroversion, on what feels like a sufficient number of friends. So I'm really fascinated by that. And I think that's, again, an issue with measuring loneliness. Hmm. Yeah. Okay. So winding back to how I was planning on starting this conversation. Oh, sorry. <laughs> no, that was me. That was me. I asked the question, <laughs> but it was important. So you mentioned your work with uh, Robin Dunbar and in this lab. So can you just give us an overview of the types of things that you're working on and why? Okay, wow, that's a big question. (laughs) So I suppose um, all of our work or all of Robin's work is looking at how do we create and maintain social relationships? How do we create social bonding? And um, Robin started off studying monkeys um, and other apes and looking at social bonding in those animals to try and then understand social bonding in humans and in monkeys other primates um bonding seems to happen through grooming so the animals groom and then they're more likely to come to each other's aid if there's a conflict or whatever um but human social groups are much larger than groups found in other primates. And so we don't have enough time to create those social bonds through one-to-one grooming. So we do still do that with our most intimate bonds, but we don't have enough time to do that with um, you know, the, the group sizes that we, we have. Um, and so we needed a more efficient way of bonding our groups and um, Robin's other kind of famous work is looking at um, brain size and group size so you get a linear relationship between the size of a 
uh, primate's brain and the size of group that they can maintain. So there seems to be this kind of cognitive limit on the number of individuals that they can keep track of. And if you take human brain size and you plug it into that primate equation, you get um, this number 150. So this is now known as Dunbar's number. And that's the kind of the size of the active network that each individual is able to maintain on average, although there is individual variation in that. Mm. So we basically need a bonding mechanism which can bond 150 individuals, and you can't do that through this one-to-one -one grooming. Um, and so we started looking at what kind of behaviours might be able to bond those large groups. And one suggestion was, um, so you needed behaviour which would have the equivalent effect of grooming and the way grooming seems to work is that it releases endorphins in the monkey brain and endorphins are kind of like morphine they give you a high uh, you know they're pleasurable um, and so one suggestion was laughter um, so if you laugh together in groups then maybe that creates this social bonding um, but laughter generally happens in conversation size groups and there seems to be a limit if you look if you go and observe in a pub or something and count the number of people in a conversation there seems to be a limit of about four people and maybe because you can't really hear people if they're far away um, and so, and unless you have a, um, a comedian or something, that's probably the limit on the number of people you can bond with after. Um, so the behaviour that I became particularly interested in was singing. Um, so I don't know whether you want me to go into talking about uh, that in a lot of detail, but um, we've done work looking at whether singing bonds groups of people together. So... Um, for instance, we collaborated with an adult education charity to look at singing groups compared to groups doing other activities. So they were doing either creative writing or arts and crafts. And we followed all these individuals over seven months. And we measured how close they felt to their class group before they sang together before they sang or did creative writing class together and then afterwards and compared that over the seven months. And what we expected to see was at the end of the seven months, the singers would be much more closely bonded than those doing the other activities. And actually, we didn't see any difference. So by the end of the seven months, everyone felt very, very close to their class group. Uh, so, you know, we were a bit, oh, didn't find anything. So we went back and uh, looked at the earlier data and what we did find was right at the start of those seven months so when the classmates were basically strangers if you looked at how close they felt to their class before they did the activity together and afterwards the singers had this huge increase in how close they felt to their classmates which you didn't see in the other activities um, and so we started thinking about singing as an icebreaker effect that it bonds people very quickly compared to other activities um, because of the comparative activities that we use we can't actually tell whether it's the singing itself that has that effect or whether it's having this common goal in creating a piece of music together so there's definitely a lot more questions that need to be looked into but yeah we were very excited to find this icebreaker effect um yeah so it's all around um social bonding how do we create um, cohesion particularly in groups and how do we maintain that cohesion and of course given the accumulating evidence that loneliness and feeling disconnection is really bad for your physical and mental health and um, there are therefore very important practical applications of this work now which is exciting. It is really exciting and there are tons of questions and I think I just happened to write many of them down. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, so where to start? Okay, so this is, you mentioned that you didn't know if it was singing that bonded people or the, the goal orientation. Um, mm -hmm. 
I have also encountered the idea that doing things in synchrony that isn't just singing, right? Like dancing or playing mm-hmm. music. Are there other sorts of activities that have similar structures or similar affective experiences or what have you uh, mm-hmm. that can have the same kind of effect or that are being investigated? Yeah, so someone else who was in Robin's group, Bronwyn Tarr, did work looking at dance as a bonding mechanism and found that it's both doing movements in synchrony, but also the amount of amount of exertion you're putting into those movements that mm. have um, kind of independent um, bonding effects. And we had we we would have liked to compare the effects of these different activities to see, you know, is there a difference between how singing bonds and how dancing bonds and maybe a difference in the the size of the group that it can bond. Yeah, so looking at um so it's really hard to measure endorphins um endorphin release um so you either need to use pet scanning which is very logistically difficult um or you need to use a lumbar puncture which isn't very pleasant isn't very ethical um to do with participants so we very often use proxy measures and because endorphins are kind of like morphine the more endorphins you have circulating in your system the more pain you should be able to withstand um so we measure people's pain thresholds in various different ways like um we use a blood pressure cuff and see how much pressure um the person can take before it becomes very uncomfortable and one study that was done here in oxford was looking at blues rowers either rowing on their own on erg machines those rowing machines or you can kind of connect those rowing machines together to create a virtual boat and they compared those two conditions and they found that if they were rowing um at the same kind of rate and the same kind of um difficulty um they could withstand much more pain if they'd been doing that in a virtual boat so doing it in synchrony with others compared to doing it on their own and um, so there does seem to be something to do um with synchrony um yeah and there's so there's now um a research group in oxford called the social body lab and they're looking into <clears throat> that kind of question um, more thoroughly hmm. um so is there any sort of theorizing happening as to whether there is some sort of reason or adaptive function related to this protective effect that comes from group activity or the synchrony, uh, or is it more of a byproduct type thing? So the current models um, of loneliness um, suggest that it does have evolutionary adaptive value um, if it's short term. So the idea is that the feeling of loneliness is kind of like hunger. So you, it basically is to motivate you to seek more connection because if you're not part of a group and you're disconnected, then it's far more likely that you get eaten by a lion or you, know, you can't get sufficient resources or whatever. Um, so in that way, it, it is thought to be adaptive. But the problem is when it becomes chronic, um, and when people feel that desire for more connection, but for some reason they're not getting that. And then that seems to be where the health problems come in, where, you know, lack of sleep and um, the immune system um, doesn't function properly and so on. Um, so, yeah, transitory loneliness seems to be fine. <laughs> not very pleasant, but okay. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's kind of like you were saying, actually, that you you had a very lonely period in your life, but you were able to overcome it. So that we don't think has any adverse consequences. And actually, it's very adaptive that you felt lonely in a way because then you sought um, bonds. Yeah. Um, and so uh, why why is singing and or sport or dance or whatever, like why are these the types of things that help create these social bonds? Um, 
So that's, I, I guess there's various levels that you could answer that on. Um, and I've mm-hmm. talked about the mechanism of endorphins. So it's sort of, so um, we need social bonds and to be part of a group because that um, helps us, would have helped us survive in mm-hmm. your hunter-gatherers. Just like other monkeys, that seems to be how they survive and um, uh, avoid predation and so on. Um, And in monkeys, that mechanism is through grooming, which is associated with endorphin release. And so this, in humans, it seems to be that these behaviours are piggybacking on that existing system. So evolution doesn't keep reinventing the wheel. It will take what already exists and that will be what then becomes an adaptation in new species, if that makes sense. Mm-hmm. Um, so I don't know whether that was the level you meant. <laughs> or yes. <laughs> yes, and, and I apologize for that lack of clarity. Um, yeah. Okay, so you also mentioned like the modern world and how yeah. these mechanisms or whatever are sort of adaptive in the sense that they direct us towards forming social bonds because we're social animals, right? Yeah. Um, is, so is there a sense in which, and I know that this is an egregiously abstract and uh, statement, is there, <laughs> you know, like you would read a headline and as a scientist you would wince because it's, anyway, is there a sense in which it could be said that the ways in which we form social bonds is unnatural I know that that's a tough word uh or um it's definitely we're definitely in a different environment that we used to be right and we're seeing like quite high rates of uh people not sort of of people struggling with loneliness yeah that's a very interesting question um so I guess one thing that strikes me about urban environment for instance is one we're dealing with much larger groups so it's not 150 people that you're surrounded by and who are familiar and who you are seeing consistently and regularly um you know you're basically surrounded by thousands if not more strangers um yeah, which is very un- unusual, I would say, in our evolutionary past. We wouldn't have had to deal with that in the past. Mm-hmm. Um, so I think, so I'm becoming increasingly interested in um, local communities versus communities based on shared interest. So I read somewhere with no reference, I couldn't follow it up, <laughs> that um, we are, are that communities based on local localization are becoming less important but we're we're moving more towards communities where there's a shared interest but you don't necessarily live together um and i find that really fascinating to know whether those communities how they differ and how are they similar in any way um and i do think so for instance, Robin's work has shown that we do need frequency of contact in order to maintain friendships. With kin, that doesn't seem to be so important. Those ties seem to be maintained without needing regular contact. But for friends, it is very important. And so if our networks aren't based on location it maybe becomes much less much harder to have that frequency of interaction um and I definitely feel that in my personal experience I think I think something like a college in a university or a shared accommodation block or something when you're a student you do get that frequent contact um and you kind of you do different activities together and you share your kind of your whole life it's, it's, it's much more integrated whereas if you're working with one group of friends and then you're living with another group and then you've moved city so you've got another group and that's it it's, it's much harder to have that frequency of contact um and have a kind of integrated network is my feeling um i'm not sure 
whether people have looked at that, um, you know, formal research, um, but I think people are starting to. So in that case, I'm not sure I'd say it was unnatural, but I would say it was a very different social environment to the one that um, we've been in for most of our history. Um, yeah, it's a very interesting question. I'm sure there's a lot more um, that could be said on that, but I think the frequency of contact is definitely um, a big one, and that it's it's um, lots of different groups. It's not just your village, and you would cooperate to you know get the harvest in and whatever. Mm-hmm. That is interesting, and I spend the well in the time I have for reading I spend the majority of my time reading about theories uh, ways in which the modern world is different you know quote unquote oh, from uh, yeah <laughs> what comes out of that then in, in this regard in this context people do talk a lot about um the urbanization effect like you mentioned right where mm-hmm. there's a lot more there is, which there never was before, this idea of being alone in a room full of strangers. Mm. You know, like you never encounter that in hardly at all until like the 1920s when cities start like really taking off. Mm. Um, And that's something people talk about all the time. They're like, I'm surrounded by people, but I feel very alone. And, um, And I think that does have something to do with you know, the intimacy of the contact. And obviously you don't know people at at Tesco or whatever. Um, There's also like feelings of alienation because uh, perhaps because our culture is uh, so oriented right now on subjectivity and individual identity. Mm. And so there's less of, um, we construct our identity slightly less in association with with groups and are seeking our personal identity. And so I think maybe that's part of why it comes so naturally for us to have, you know, I have my community of scholar friends and dance friends and friends who live in this city and front, right. Friends who live in that city, as you were saying, it's all so disparate. And, um, there's a lot of talk about the, like the formation of new modern identities. Um, and I see that playing a role in our sort of, it's, oh, it's almost self-isolating, you know, as we're trying to build our own narrative. Mm. Yeah, it's interesting. Um, it struck me as you were talking, um, what I was saying earlier about having a shared, a collective goal or purpose. Mm. And I wonder whether that is lacking a little bit in some of these friendship groups. Yeah, that actually... That makes oh, that makes a lot of sense to me. And there's also been a lot of work done on like the skyrocketing of distrust, uh, distrust of institutions and people generally, you know, um, and there really isn't, you know, once upon a time, say, in the time when singing was evolving, you had, there was a shared narrative and literally a hundred percent of the people you knew shared in that narrative. Right. And you understood where you came from and where you were going. And nowadays you have, it's like a pick your own adventure story, right? Um, (laughs) Yeah. It's, it's a very subjective, very freewheeling, like go get them kind of environment, which on one hand people can find very liberating, but on the other hand uh, can be very oppressive in terms of how, uh, how much pressure is involved with that and anxiety and isolation. Mm, Yeah. I think that's definitely true. Uh, Is there a way to study that empirically? (laughs) Uh, well, there's quite a lot of different research questions there. <laughs> I'm, yeah. I'm just when you were talking about um, the skyrocketing um, distrust, um, that one of the um, factors associated with loneliness, so which is talked about as a risk factor, is lack of trust. So on an individual mm-hmm. level, individuals who have less trust um, in other people generally are more likely to be lonely. So that's that's interesting. That's very interesting. What are um, what are some other risk factors for loneliness? Um, so there's things like um, things like um, 
physical disability, for instance, um, lack of transport. So the the, the kind of character, the um, things that might socially isolate you. But of course, as you said, there is this loneliness in a crowd um, phenomenon, which I find particularly interesting. So people have these opportunities to connect, but they're still not. So what is it that's creating these barriers to bonding for them? Um, and, and there's quite a lot of work suggesting that there are cognitive biases associated with loneliness. So, for instance, someone who is lonely is more likely to interpret ambiguous situations as socially threatening. Mm -hmm. uh, again, that's linked to this distrust. Um, um, but they're more like they're, they're better at remembering, uh, remembering um, social facts, which is interesting. And there's kind of there's ambiguous results on whether they are better or worse at identifying emotional expressions, which is a kind of um, a proxy for social skills. Um, and there's one study which is interesting, which suggests that, um, so they had the same measure of um, whether you could I correctly identify the emotional expression on um, pictures of faces. And they either told, so they told half the participants, um, this is a measure of um, social skills, people who are good at this, um, you know, have lots of friends and are, uh, you know, have families and so on. Um, or um, they told them that it was a measure of general intelligence. Um, mm not social skills specifically. And lonely people did equally well when they thought this test was about general intelligence, but they did much worse when they were told it was about social skills. So there's this idea that maybe lonely people, because they really want this connection, there's more pressure because, you know, this interaction needs to work. Um, and so they kind of, they freeze up. And there's that idea that that social anxiety may be what's blocking them um, being able to make that connection um, and lonely people do tend to evaluate themselves much more poorly than non-lonely people and also evaluate others more poorly mm. so yeah it's a very I don't know I think it that can create a lot of feedback so that people get into this kind of chronic state of more and more threatening so they withdraw so other people don't feel connected to them and then they feel more lonely and so on. Right. Yeah. Um, and I, I have people in my life who I care about a lot who are in those kinds of positions and I have tried so many things. I've tried so many things to help and I, I don't, you know, I'm at a bit of a loss. Uh, has there, is there work done on, I mean, obviously now we're getting into more like psychological interventions and therapy, but um, is there anything to suggest that these kinds of cycles of loneliness can be broken? Um, so there is um, a meta-analysis from 2011 that looked at different forms of interventions and they found that the most effective seemed to be these cognitive, so interventions that would target these cognitive um, biases. Um, but um, those interventions were also the most likely to have been studied through um, randomised control trials. Um, I think because of the maybe the nature of um, the intervention, but also the kinds of people that are going to be interested in something like cognitive behaviour therapy are probably going to come from that more experimental approach, is my feeling. So that seems to be the indication, but I think we need more work looking at that. Mm. Uh, but interestingly, there was recently a large-scale survey on loneliness conducted with BBC with a collaboration with uh, researchers from Manchester, Brunel and Exeter. And they asked people um, what helps when you're lonely or if you've been lonely in the past, what helped and what didn't help. <laughs> um, and I can't remember um, exactly what the findings were, but they do on their website, I think, have a list of the top five or something. And some of them were just having a chat um, with anyone. So it wasn't necessarily chatting to your friends, but it was just, I don't know, being acknowledged by someone in the street, having mm. a chat with someone at the bus stop. Um, so quite sort of little, little um, things seem to have an effect and I think that's really important for us to remember um, that we could be having a really large effect if we just smile at someone 
even if we don't know them or that's yeah that's what we're trying to do um but also um things like um taking up a new pastime going to a, a new group so things like going to a singing class um but not everyone wants to go into a group and i think that's been the problem with interventions for learning so far is we don't really understand what's going on but we think oh well lonely therefore they must need more social opportunities so let's just put them into a group and that'll <laughs> solve it and I think it's much more complicated than that that really doesn't work for everyone lots of people don't consider them to be kind of joiners in that way so um, mm. I mean befriending seems to work for some people I mean it, what kinds of things have you tried if you don't must mind my asking um I have made a number of suggestions that all all of which have been um, rejected, I think, because of social anxiety, you know. Um, and so, you know, we were talking about these feedback loops, you know, mm. and uh, if you're too anxious to try anything, right, mm. too anxious to try talking to a stranger, too anxious to try talking to a friend, too anxious to, mm. you know, X, Y, and Z things, um, mm. then then you're then you're in a bit of a tough spot, you know, you're pinned and, and you need to, um, I'm not sure, actually, I'm not sure. I'm still, lo I'm still looking for answers. Oh, um, that reminds me that there's been, um, a recent paper looking at mindfulness mm -hmm. and I've, I've thought for quite some time that mindfulness might help. Um, and in that study, they were using a mindfulness app and mm -hmm. it would, I think it was designed to help with stress, but they found that people using um, this app, um, so yeah, they had various different conditions, but the app that helped them to be aware of their feelings and to accept them um, was associated with an increase of, I think something like two new social interactions a day or two more social mm -hmm. interactions a day compared to the control. Um, and a reduction in loneliness. Um, my feeling is that if you had an intervention that had that element of dealing with the psychological potential cognitive biases and gave opportunities for social engagement, that would be more effective than either just looking at the psychological or giving opportunities. Um, but I'm yet to, to do that work. <laughs> but yeah, I do plan to um, do that. But I think mindfulness or some kind of um psychological um help might be what some people need in order to then go mm -hmm. out to talk to people um, yeah that definitely that definitely makes sense um you were talking about how important it can be to smile at somebody right uh it would be friendly in public but we do have this like very heavy social norm, especially here in the UK, right? Um, of of keeping of keeping to yourself and um, and is is there a sense in which? And I don't mean to impose nature culture binaries here, but is there a sense in which? Um, we talked about Dunbar's number, right? Do we resist the? emotional energy or whatever that it would take to interact with strangers precisely because we have those like cognitive limitations? Um, I think those might be separate mm. kind of pathways. Um, well, that's good. I guess, yeah. <laughs> I guess the argument with the brain and the cognitive limits is the actually keeping track of people. So um, the number of people who you can kind of know where they are, know what they're doing, how are they relating to other people in your network and how does that um, reflect back to you is kind of different from the mm. kind of endorphin route where I guess the cognitive this is my understanding. I'm not sure whether Robin would say this, but um, my understanding would be that the cognitive limits um, 
are to do with those one-to-one relational bonds, mm. whereas the endorphin and emotional elements would be more to do with the collective community bonding group. Um, there are time limits as well, because at the different layers of your network, you need to invest more time. So with your best friends, you need much more time to get that emotionally close than if you are talking about an acquaintance, for example. So it's not just cognitive constraints, there's also time constraints. Um, but the, yeah, I mean, smiling does not take a lot of effort. <laughs> and it creates, I think it probably creates um, a feel a feeling good both in the person who's smiling and you know if, if it's reciprocated um so I mean, yeah the um the cost <laughs> benefit seems yeah. to skew heavily in terms of the benefit right if if it doesn't yeah. take that much to present a kind face yeah. and you and another person get happier then you know yeah. all we have to do is push back against thousands of years of cultural indoctrination <laughs> Yeah, I mean, well, I suppose also in evolutionary terms, it would have paid to be suspicious of strangers because they could attack you. Um, but that doesn't generally happen in our culture. Right. <laughs> so um, It doesn't, although people th- think it will, right? Mm-hmm. Like, I mean, we were talking about distrust and uh, I've, I've been doing a lot of reading about fear and uh mm-hmm. I actually, before we got on this call, finished reading a chapter about the fear of strangers. Um, Yeah, because we have just, and in part, of course, it has to do, I think, with the ways in which communities have been transformed and Mm. the discourse of fear has, you know, whatever, multiplied throughout the last hundred years or so. But um, people, people are afraid of strangers, although I don't think that's necessarily what stops people from smiling on the street. Although... I do know, like, I do know, for example, a lot of women, myself included, who really, really want to smile at men all the time, but some of the time that's like seen as an invitation and you don't like, (laughs) you don't want that, you know? And so, um, there are, I think, levels of distrust in the way, although also I think it's, I think it's, 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 it's exaggerated, right? The distrust is far disproportionate to the actual statistics of strangers that could hurt you. Mm, It's interesting because I definitely notice myself with those kinds of biases, like not smiling at young men, for instance. And Mm -hmm. it is, yeah, whereas I'm much more likely to smile at older people and other women. Yeah. And and I know men who are terrified of of smiling at women because they don't want them to get the wrong idea, you know, Um, which is, it's really sad because yeah, in a lot of ways we're trying to protect each other and in, in, in doing so being disconnected. Yeah, and it's interesting because this goes back to um, one of your earlier questions about how you know how is this un- are we trying to bond in unnatural ways? And that I mean, we would have in us in smaller communities we would have known everyone, so it would have been okay to smile at each other. Whereas now, there's so many more strangers. Probably most of the people that we come in contact with are strangers, and so um, yeah, we're not getting those smiles. I mean, so, uh, as part, I think it was as part of the Joe Cox Loneliness Commission. I've got a little badge um, that I wear on my coat, which says happy to chat. Um, so, yeah, that's something that I've taken on. And, yeah, I mean, I'm not sure if it's made much difference. I'm, I tend to try and um, chat to people anyway, mm. um, just because I think you know, even though we have this um, maybe biological drive to be wary of strangers and, yeah, I think probably the cultural um, drive to be polite and, in you know, um, I just think that the negative effects of loneliness are so much greater that, yeah, I'm willing yeah. to, you know, try and break yeah. those and 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 most people do respond not everyone but most people do and I think I think part of the reason I do it is that it just makes me really sad when people are rushing to where, wherever they're going and they're on their phone and they're just not looking up they're not looking up at other people and so I sometimes I kind of say morning just <laughs> the matter of that kind of because I don't know whether you get this but when you get into that tunnel and it's really stressful mm-hmm. 
So, yeah, I might have got a little bit of a mission. <laughs> no, I, I like that so much. And, and I am as well. I mean, yeah. it's obvious how transformative it can be sometimes sometimes it's just like pleasant like that's the thing like the worst it usually is is just baseline present but sometimes it can like really change somebody's day and you can feel it you know um and that thing you said about being in the tunnel you know like I can definitely when I'm in a hurry I've got a lot to do I get very stressed out and I get I become the meanest version of me and I hate that me and I I know that it happens because I have anxieties and I'm trying to take care of them but if somebody walking down the sidewalk said a sunny hi to me I think that would probably snap me out of it a little bit you know um so I appreciate what you're trying to do there (laughs) <laughs> thank you <laughs> yeah it's, I mean um it's interesting when we're feeling down and isolated um that we have very unhelpful behaviors that we try to use to compensate for that. So for instance, um there's been work suggesting that lonely people eat more and they eat more rubbish food. So there was one experiment where um <laughs> thinking about it, I'm not sure how ethical this is, but anyway, they told half the put or no, um so one condition they told the participants um so they got sorry, they got everyone to do a personality test and then some of the participants, they said, oh, you've got the kind of personality where, you know, you're going to be really successful in your life. You're going to have lots of friends and family. You're going to have a very happy marriage. And they told another set of participants, oh, I'm really sorry. You're the kind of personality who's going to end up alone. And you may get married, but it's going to break up pretty quickly. Um, and then they told the last group, um, you're the kind of personality who's very clumsy and you're probably going to break your bones quite a bit in your life. So they had these three conditions. So future connected, future disconnected, and then future kind of catastrophe or something. And they then um, got uh, the participants. So there was several different experiments, but in one of them, they had um, cookies and the the participants task was to rate how tasty these cookies were and they could eat as many as they liked in order to get a um, reliable rating and the lonely future alone condition ate far more cookies than the other um the other conditions Um, and they also had the kind of opposite where the future connected participants drank much more of this supposedly healthy but disgusting drink than the lonely participants. So it seemed like the lonely um, individuals, even though it was just that priming, they weren't actually lonely. It was just Mm -hmm. transitory uh, experience. Um, Didn't seem to be caring for themselves as much. Um, And I think... I don't know, from my experience, if I'm feeling low, I'm much more likely to reach for the chocolate. And actually, I'd probably be much better off ringing a friend or something. And yet there's something much easier about that kind of self-medicating mm. with calories than um, connecting with others. But it's really the connecting with others that we really need and yeah the humans have this really strong desire to but to belong um yeah but there's something quite scary about it i think it's the possibility of rejection isn't it and i think um lonely individuals are very sensitive to that possibility i definitely see in my personal experience throughout my life that avoiding rejection or like preemptively you know, preemptively pulling out of situations in which you think you might be rejected, right? Like that's a primary theme. And I'm, I don't think I'm alone in that. I think that's exceedingly common um, because it's so unpleasant, but then it ends up being self-defeating, you know? And Mm. so um, I've actually been doing a lot of reading about the concept of resilience. Um, Okay. Brené Brown? uh, Actually, no, uh, more like in sociological literature. Um, Although Brené Brown is fantastic. Uh, and, and just the idea, right. The idea that, um, 
it's, it's a, I think it's an underappreciated concept, but if we can build, you know, focus on resilience, then the prospect of rejection isn't so Mm. right it's it's not so painful because uh, you've developed the skills or the experience or the resources that um mm. you know help you deal with that um as to how people develop resilience uh, that's definitely not my wheelhouse but i think it's important you know it's interesting because um one of the things um that seems to have surprised people is so quite often loneliness is seen as something in older adults Mm -hmm. and actually we're also finding that it's very prevalent in young adults so 16 to 25 year olds and um, again from the BBC um, study um, one of the things that the researchers were suggesting was well maybe those young adults this is the first time that they felt loneliness and they just don't know what to do Um, and they don't realize that it can be transitory they think it's going to be this horrible for Ever. Mm. Um, and so that kind of um, teaching people resilience and you know, and that things are t- transitory and strategies for um, dealing with these kinds of painful experiences, I think would be really great. And if we could teach that to young adults, you know, the mm. skills that they can use for the rest of their lives, that's hopefully going to mean that most people do not get into this chronic lonely state and you know that will then have downstream um, repercussions for health and well-being so I mean have you come across ways to build resilience because it's it's sort of like a um a trendy thing to talk about but I, I'm not aware of whether people mm. have designed ways of um increasing resilience well so the um I mentioned that I've most of my reading has been in like history and in sociology, but uh, what those authors have noticed is that our, um, the way that we manage risks has transformed pretty significantly or things that we're afraid of, generally speaking, you know, there was once, uh, so the theory goes once a time when, especially when we had shared cultural narratives about that taught us about how, what c- things to fear and how to make sense of it. When we had these kinds of narratives, fear helped signal to us something objective or outside of us that we needed to wrestle with or overcome. Um, and then as we lost these cultural narratives and also as we developed the sciences of psychology, um, we sort of, again, very collectively and vaguely uh, unhooked fear and things that threaten us from these shared cultural narratives. Um, And then they become much more ambiguous and we become uh, much more subjective. And again, with the science of psychology, much more subjectively um, subject to them. Right. Uh, And so um, there's a, sociologist his name is frank ferretti and he says um according to him one of the biggest problems with the modern world is that we have turned our we've sort of flipped things around such that it's not only that we're afraid of things but we feel incapable of handling them precisely because we just have this like very amorphous um, sea of things that threaten us and, and we feel very vulnerable in front of it. And so in a very broad sense, um, we've, we've created, we've sort of created a world in which we stand in front of these massive threats and just feel, um, helpless as to what can be done about that. Uh, Actually, again, Ferretti thinks it has a lot to do with um, how we raise our children, you know, and um, how much risk we expose them to and encourage them to um, to take. Uh, yeah, he said he said something that I thought was very interesting. He said, um, nowadays, the modern or the secular saying, be safe or get home safe. It's like a secular version of saying, may God be with you. You know, we're just we're very we're very attuned to, to safety and that might actually be to our detriment. Mm, interesting. Yeah, I talked for a very long time. I don't normally do that when I interview people. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's fascinating. I just wonder how, I mean, I think that all kind of resonates with me. I just wonder how 
you translate that into something practical right yeah and I like I give sometimes I give inspirational speeches like that's something I do with my time you can give all the inspirational speeches in the world and they might affect people on a you know it might be kind of transitorily nice yeah. but I think I think you're absolutely right that in terms of like a concrete systematic change uh, that's that's a lot more that's god that's enormous it's just that's so big um yeah, so many, I mean, I wonder, so many things. I wonder whether um kind of going back to mindfulness and kind of awareness of those things mm. is a very important first step is one of the things that I have come across in um, older papers, so kind of from the 1980s, um, is the thought that loneliness isn't just disconnection from others, but it's also disconnection from yourself. Mm. Kind of, and that's why I think mindfulness um, might be helpful for some people. So that, and I haven't quite. Um, got my head around exactly what that means but it just sort of seemed to make intuitive sense to me um, that you kind of need to I guess going back to resilience and that kind of I'm okay you kind of need that sense before you can engage with others or something yeah I think you're right I've always felt a little bad like it's a cop-out to say like oh we need awareness that's what people in the humanities are always saying like (laughs) like, I'm like (laughs) we need awareness of this issue and we need awareness of that um but it is very true in this I think this practice of mindfulness I mean there's been so many studies that have demonstrated uh the ways in which it can sort of ground you in yourself you know or um I think what, well, what this study that I mentioned earlier showed was that it wasn't just awareness but it was also acceptance yes um yeah but I just wonder with, with this kind of uh, amorphous anxiety that you talked about where it's not clear what the target of our fear is just being with those feelings with ang- of anxiety and just um accepting mm. them. Anyway, I was, I'm trying oh, to come well, up with practical outcomes. You no, know, actually, <laughs> I do. Um, I, I'm writing a book on this. Actually, there's. Um, oh, no. <laughs> I am. Wow, you um, do quite a lot, eh? <laughs> <laughs> uh, on um, actually, it's it's uh, well. Anyway, I can tell you about it later. But um, in in pursuit of answers to these questions, one person who I spoke with, uh, I actually interviewed on this podcast episode number 21. Uh, and, uh, his name is Eric Kruglansky too. He's a social psychologist. Um, and he has studied close mindedness and extremism and, uh, in doing so has unearthed, um, ways in which our feelings of significance can really help us uh, well, they help us be less close minded which is really relevant to his work, but they also, um, they, Im- they are, they improve our self-esteem, they improve our sense of well-being. And so something I think perhaps more practical that we could do that would maybe give people enough of a feeling of personal solidity to engage others would be to uh, provide platforms for people to learn skill sets that make them feel more significant to their communities. Um, which is actually something that Kruglansky has documented happening and being effective in de-radicalizing terrorists. Um, Yay. So a kind of sense of purpose, a sense of yeah. giving back. And, uh, yes, I think that's a very important part of loneliness, actually. I'm not sure whether people are, are, have looked at that, but that's my sense. And also, um, you're talking about significance. Um, I didn't quite know exactly what you meant, but it reminded me I was talking to someone who did research looking at um, weak connections in cities. So that's strangers or acquaintances. And one of the themes that she found in her interviews was that people really valued, it's sort of being acknowledged or Mm -hmm. being, you know, um, this thing again where we talked about you know just smiling at someone or saying hello just recognizes that they're an individual worthy of notice or something yeah um, I wonder if that's an aspect of significance as you were talking about it 
Yeah. And that's um, what you mentioned that and the sense of purpose, I think are both a, a piece of it, you know, and this also ties into uh, existentialist literature uh, and, and the psychology of terror management, right? Because um, they're often talking about how sig- like we have a desire for significance very, again, very generally speaking, um, in part because it helps us resist um, threats. It helps us resist uh, things that t- like erode our stability, our existence, our sense mm-hmm. of belonging, our sense of um, importance. I think our sense of importance to other people is, is uh, it's another layer, I think, on top of connection, right? You don't just want to connect with people, but you want to feel like you matter to them. Um, and so cultivating skills, I think, or ways in which to contribute to a community, I think can help you f- sort of buffer yourself against uh, the kind of very human, you know, concerns or feelings we have about insignificance and loss and meaninglessness and all that sort of stuff. Although that's, again, that's a very 21st century phenomena. So, <laughs> yeah, I mean, so that sort of makes me think of two things. One is that basically if I don't know what to do with myself, I volunteer. Mm. And, that seems to be, and that's what I often suggest to other people. And I think that's a sort of intuitive response of, um, yeah, just if you, if you give, then that actually, um, makes you feel better which is yeah. kind of I don't know an odd way of thinking about it because I guess if you're lonely you're feeling quite um closed down and yeah threatened and so that's the last thing in the world that you'd want to do is kind of go out and but that's what you kind of need and I think actually that was one of the things listed in the BBC um as a volunteer um what was the other thing Oh, I forgot what the I should I should be making notes and then I'd remember. Um, no, it's gone. Sorry, it's okay. <laughs> that was that was a really nice point by itself. <laughs> um, you can always email me if you think of it. I, I we have been talking for a long time. I feel like I I have to let you oh. go. Um, oh, okay. Yeah, it's it's been an hour. Um, okay. It was, bef- did you have any other questions that you wanted to quickly cover? Or no? Well, no. That was incredibly thorough, and I think you really? said a lot of you said a lot of really nice things. Are there any sort of summarizing or final thoughts that you might want to share? Um, well, just that I think this is a really fascinating um, area, and I'm really delighted to be researching it. I guess. Yes. I think what's interesting is that um, when I tell people that I'm interested in researching loneliness, everyone has something to say on it. Mm. So, you know, it can be a neighbour of my parents who, (laughs) you know, so my parents live in a rural area and she was talking to me about um, thinking that maybe rural children, um, maybe particularly firstborns, um, because they don't, get a lot of interaction with other people that this that they kind of struggle with social skills and social situations um and she was telling me about um that there's a critical period in which you have to socialize calves and kind of wondering whether it was the same with human children um or you know other people will say oh yeah in the church i go to this is what we do or you know everyone has um some kind of engagement with this topic um which is really wonderful. I get amazing ideas from talking to people. So that's yeah. really nice. Yeah. Well, it is a, there are a few things, you know, we hesitate to talk about universals, but I think, yeah. I think loneliness is, is pretty high up there, you know, of yeah. things we share. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, okay. Well, thank you again. Uh, thank well, you thank so, you. so, so much. Um, this has been really lovely. And thank you, everybody, uh, everybody who's tuning in. Uh, I'm, I'm hopeful this was as enlightening for you as it was for me. Um, yeah. Okay. Uh, thank you so much. Is there anywhere that, um, are you like on Twitter or something? Do you want people to follow you or no? (laughs) Well, um, I've just started working at university college, London, um, 
as one of the coordinators um, of a new research network which is looking at loneliness and social isolation in mental health mm. um, so you could follow that if you wanted um, so I think it is oh now what is it I think it's at UCL underscore loneliness great um, yeah so Okay. Um, in the network, that would be great. <laughs> <laughs> okay, good. Good to know. And uh, everybody knows where uh, to find me at Stephanie Ruper on all the social media platforms. Um, thank you again, uh, Ellie, and thank you, everybody. Okay, take care. Thanks.